good, yeah. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Brandon. I am our associate minister here at The Cove, and I'm really excited to be talking with you guys today. We started off last week in a series called Overheard, and I started talking about some of my habits over the past couple years as an adult, and some of you found that funny, some of you found it concerning, um, and so I want to continue talking about those habits as we, as we start off today, because a lot of what we talked about last week was eating. You know, my butter noodles, my chicken, my eggs, all that kind of stuff. You all had a lot to say about that. I appreciate it. Um, But when I was growing up, I added something to that repertoire, which was Mountain Dew. I've talked about that before. I was addicted to Mountain Dew. And from like 16 to a long time, I was told, hey, you're going to pay for that by the time you hit 25. Like you are going to pay for just eating butter noodles, chicken, chocolate chip cookies, Mountain Dew. Like it's going to catch up to you at 25. And I want to stand up here on stage and let all of you that say that, said that, know that you were wrong. It did not catch up to me at 25. I didn't pay for it at 25. I paid for it at 28. Uh, 28 was a rough year for me. I don't know what happened, but working out just got hard. Many of you know what this is like. Like I, I was doing the same workouts that I've been doing for the whole, my whole life, and it just hit a wall. It got a lot harder. It was harder to recover. If I overindulged, which is something I'm very good at when I'm eating, um, it had bigger consequences. And I would like to preface that statement with, while I wrote this, I slammed a giant bowl of chocolate chip cookie dough. Uh, so not much has changed, right? I still overindulge quite a bit, but I had been dieting a certain way for 10 years up to 28 as an adult, and it's really hard to just change. When you hit that wall, when you get to a place, it's really hard to, to, to shift because I was stuck in a habit. I was stuck in how I was living. I liked what I was doing, and I had been doing it for a long time, and so it was really hard to make that change. I was still working out. I ate, we'll call it okay, but I had slowly just started gaining weight and gaining weight. And then from 28, that peaked last December. So last December was an interesting month. We were a little burnt out, me and my wife, on rock climbing. That's what we did for exercise. Uh, We had some life changes going on, and we were, I don't know if you guys know this, but December is a busy month for us in ministry. Um, So we were busy here, and so I had stopped working out, uh, but I kept eating as if I was working out. And so this peaked in December because in the month of December, six months ago, I gained a whole 20 pounds in one month. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, how hard it is to do that, um, but it's pretty impressive, honestly. Like, I'm, I'm talented, um, and if you need help gaining 20 pounds in a month, I'm your guy. If you need help losing 20 pounds in a month, go to Elliot. Um, <laughs> but I, I, was, I was stuck in a way of life. I couldn't change. I had no ability to shift how I was eating and what I was doing. And maybe you guys know that to be true in your life. Maybe you just get stuck in a bad habit. Maybe it's not eating or whatever for you, but we get to a point where our problems peak, right? Our problems, they, they catch up to us and they walk with us until they peak. The, the, the problem it has this moment where it goes from like, oh, I can just wear a baggy or t-shirt to, oh no, I don't have a shirt in the next size up and my midriff is showing, right? And so sometimes we get to that point where we're just taking measures in our life to hide everything, to cover it up, to make sure nobody can see the bad habit. This is what sin does to our life, is we walk with it and we get to a point where we wear the beggier t-shirt, but then we get to a point where it's really hard to cover up. It causes us to hide. It causes us to avoid people, whether it's our spouse or maybe the church, a friend group, our life group. We bury it. We bury it. Instead of removing the sin, instead of removing the bad habit, we change our life to revolve around that thing so that no one can see it. We don't want anyone to know it's there. And then we fast forward a couple months, years, I don't know how far it is, and we feel stuck. You don't know how you got to the point where you're at. You forget the journey it took to get there. But you certainly don't know how to fix it. 
There's shame involved. There's embarrassment involved. And I don't know if you, you like being stuck, but I don't. I've never met somebody that enjoys feeling stuck, and it happens to us all the time. We get stuck in this rut of spirituality, and our, our lives have adapted and changed so much to cover over the problem, and now we're in a place where we feel out of time, we're stressed out, we're panicked, and we're in this hole, and we don't see a way to get out of it. Today's scripture, we're going to be diving into that idea of being stuck, of what it looks like to be in a place where you've changed your life so much that it's going to take drastic change to get out of it. We're going to be in John chapter 4 today. If you guys want to follow along in your paper Bibles, you can follow along on the version app as well. And we're going to be looking at a conversation with Jesus that is so layered. It is an onion. It's like an ogre. It is layered and layered and layered and layered. And so I promise you guys, I am not going to be able to get to everything that this story has to say. So if I miss something, I would love to talk to you guys about it later. But do know that I know that I am missing stuff. This is just a meaty story. We could preach a whole sermon series on it. John chapter 4, verse 4. Now he, he is Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, this is the same Jacob. This is the Jacob that carried forth the promise of Abraham, had the sons that spread out and created the nation of Israel. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. I don't know if you all know this. In the Middle East, at noon, it's generally hot. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? And through this, we're going to get two parentheses that tell us some important information. His disciples had gone into town to buy food, so Jesus was alone. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We're going to dive into that a lot later. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So now we get some imagery, but it doesn't quite fit with the woman. So she says, sir, you have nothing to draw water with the well, and the well is deep. She gets a little defensive here. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? So Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water, well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. More imagery, but it's just not sticking with the woman. So the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep drawing from the well. Now we're going to get to a part just like last week with Zacchaeus. I don't think we have the whole conversation here. It's going to start jumping. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. She replied, I have no husband. Jesus said, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man you are with now, he's not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. I can see our ancestors, another jump, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. For you Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we Jews worship what we do know. I need you guys to highlight the next two verses in your Bible because we can't talk about them today. But they're so, so important. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So the woman's catching on and she says, I, I know that a Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you. And you see that dash? I don't know how your Bible denotes that dash there, but that is a very significant dash that we're going to get to in a little bit. I am he. Long story, big story. So let's look at Jesus' perspective, the woman's perspective, and we'll kind of see where that road drives us. Um, so Jesus is walking, and I don't know about you guys, but you might ask, why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? Was this on his way to where he was going? 
Um, is this, was he on a rush and had to get somewhere? Um, because if you, Jews don't go through Samaria. Jews and Samaritans, they don't interact. They don't talk. They do not like each other. They hate each other, like passionately. And Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. There were roads that were made around this nation for Jews to travel on so that they did not have to associate with Samaritans. And we're going to learn later on that Jesus stayed there for two days. He wasn't in a rush. So we ask, why do you have to go through Samaria? And we talked a little bit about it last week, but Jesus is about breaking down unnecessary boundaries. Emphasis on the unnecessary. Because Samaritans and Jews, like I said, they hated each other, they didn't talk. And and here's why. In Ezra chapter 4, the Samaritans offered to help the Jews rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Because the Jews were coming back from exile, they're rebuilding the temple. And, And they say, we're good, we don't need your help. So, the Samaritans refused to worship in that temple. They built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. They had this nice little church split in the nation of Israel where they fought with each other and started their own churches. And the one on Mount Gerizim is near where Jesus is standing now, and the tension of this reached its peak around 400 B.C. And I would love to say that that's all that happened, but in 128 B.C., in the intertestamental period, you know, 100 or so years before Jesus, it gets a whole lot worse because this same temple, the one on Mount Gerizim, that the Samaritans built, it got burnt down. And anybody want to take a wild guess at who burnt it down? The Jews. The Jews burnt it down. So tensions were really high. They did not like each other. We're talking about a hate that very few of us know in our culture today. I mean, this is hate of all hates. And we look at verse 4 and it says, Jesus had to go through Samaria, right through the middle. Sometimes there's man-made barriers in our life that needs a God-sized power to walk right through it and break it down. So now let's take a look at what the woman starts off in this story. She's walking out to the well around noon. Uh, If you all have ever studied tribal tribes or small communities, they don't go collect water at noon. Uh, They collect water in the morning because it's colder in the morning. And wells and sources of water, that's their water cooler, the same that we would reference in our workplace where we talk about how bad the Jaguars are and we catch up on politics and we gossip about the things we heard this weekend. The well is the same exact place in the ancient world. So you would go to the well in the morning and the women were generally the people who would go and gather water for their families and you would stand around the well with all the people and you would talk, you would catch up, you would get your water and you'd head home with your water for the day. So why is this woman coming at noon? Well, most likely because she's the subject of the gossip. We know that she was sleeping around in the town, and, and so she was outcasted. She was on the side. She got pushed to the side, and she was alone. And many of us know what it feels like to be the subject of gossip and to be pushed to the side by someone, and it's not very fun. And so she comes to the well at noon because she wants to come to the well when absolutely nobody's there. And she's walking up to this well at noon, and not only is there a man there, but there's a Jewish man there. So from a far distance, she's already put on edge. Jews don't speak to Samaritans. Men don't speak to women. And this man walks up and asks her for a drink. And so then Jesus offers her living water, And in doing so, he knows that she can't quite accept it. She can't accept the living water at first, and there's two reasons for that. The first is that she has to approach him for it. Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would approach me, and I would give it to you. That same gift of living water, which represents salvation, which is given through her son Jesus, the request for that living water has to be made first. She has to ask him first for it. She has to acknowledge who Jesus is, realize who she's standing in front of. And the other issue she has is the sin issue. Jesus asks the woman, go get your husband. And then he pulls back the curtain on her life and kind of says, hey, I know all of it. I know all of it. I know know what it is. And, And so she has to address, she has the opportunity to come clean about who she is, what she's done, and how she's living her life. 
Sin has to be addressed and changed. The gift of living water that Jesus offers, it comes with the condition of repentance and accepting of the Savior. So the woman hasn't realized who Jesus is. She notices that Jesus is a prophet or that he's something special. She realizes it. She's starting to get there. And then she hears a two-word phrase that to us would sound a whole lot like nothing. And it's that dash we were talking about. I said how important that dash is. It separates Jesus saying, I am he. And he didn't just say, I am he, like I am Brandon or I'm tired or I'm confused. It's not the same I am there. The I am that Jesus said are the two defining words that God used to present himself to Moses. So when Moses is at the burning bush and and he's going, who should I tell the leaders I'm talking to? And God says, tell them I am. Immediately, those two words were put into a, a holy, holy place. People didn't use those words. Those words were reserved for God and God alone. So when Jesus sits down and he says these two words, he says, I am God, to end this conversation with this woman. So this woman is now presented with the idea that she might be standing in front of Messiah. And she has to choose. She has to choose if she wants what Jesus is offering. Because she's very interested in living water to be made whole again, to not have to worry about the hurts and the pains, to not have to thirst. We strive for that. But living water always comes with life change. Living water will always come with life change. And so Jesus addresses the sin issue and offered a gift to the woman, and she has to respond. But we don't get any more of the conversation between Jesus and the woman. We don't. It ends. The next thing we get in scripture is the disciples coming back and they're like, hey, you're talking to a Samaritan woman, like problem, same thing that the woman did. And so Jesus explains the whole conversation to the disciples. But we do know the decision that she made. We might not have gotten it from her mouth. We might not have been able to see it in the conversation. But we get to see down in verse 39, the decision that the woman made, that this could be Christ. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. He told me everything I ever did. The I ever did is why she went to the well at noon. It's why she was hiding. It's why she didn't talk to these people. It's why she wasn't very liked in this community. And here's the thing. When you get introduced into a relationship with Jesus, the things that you find shameful about your life turn into testimony for his kingdom because he is way greater than our failures and he turns your failures into successes. And we get to see that here. It says, so so when the Samaritans came to him, Jesus, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed with them for two days. Jesus wasn't in a rush. Jesus came here on purpose because the Samaritans needed to know who he was was and because of his words many more became believers and they said to the woman we no longer believe just because of what you said now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world this town that didn't talk to jews has changed because the low life sleeping around hiding and not knowing anybody woman has changed her tune she went from hiding her entire life and keeping quiet to not being able to stop talking about the amazing gift that Jesus had given her in living water. But that gift couldn't have been addressed without acknowledging the Savior and addressing the sin issue. And that same gift, that same Messiah, he's standing in front of all of us today offering you living water. But it comes with the same condition. Acknowledging who Jesus is and what he's offering, and the sin issue. The woman we meet here at the well needs living water to produce that life change in her because sin changes your life, and she had changed so much she didn't know how to get back on track. She needed the living water to change her life, and so do we. Sometimes we get just as stuck as the woman at the well. It might not be sleeping around, and it might be. 
I don't know what it is for you. It could be alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography. It could be anger. It could be hate. It could be a different sin. I'm not sure. It could be where we worship, which is something she struggled with. We, we say it a little differently in our culture, right? We say, I don't feel God. That's, I don't know where to worship is I don't feel God. We focus on what a relationship with God is supposed to feel like, even though that relationship isn't based on feeling. I mean, there's feeling involved in it when the relationship is moving. But if you solely base your relationship with God on what you feel from him, not only are you looking in the wrong place, but you're going to be severely disappointed because you probably won't feel very much when you're waiting on God to act because he's waiting on you to act. He's waiting on you to take steps because like every relationship, the one you have with God takes action. It takes asking for a drink. And Jesus told the woman, he said, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, the roles would be reversed here. And sometimes you might feel like God is the one that pulled away from you. He's the one that left you alone and you want to blame God for your life circumstances, but God never left you. You left him. And it was you or another person that made the bad decision that put your life where it is today. It was not God. Jesus is waiting on you and God's still waiting on you. They never stopped offering the gift because that's who they are and they've never changed. So they're still there waiting on you. God, Jesus, they've already approached you. So are you going to approach him? Are you going to ask for a drink? Which sounds exciting, but let me preface it. When you ask for a drink, from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's going to bring some stuff up about your life. It's going to bring up the sin issues. And it's really easy to stand on stage and say, repent, repent of your sin. But the woman at the well shows just just how difficult it is to address those things. Because with sin comes, like we've said so much today, deep shame, deep guilt. Some of it comes from ourselves. Some of it comes from other people. So much that it drives us to go to a well at noon to avoid absolutely everyone. Because if there's one thing I've learned, it's where sin persists. It will always change our life and our routines. Sin is going to change your life and your routine to make sure that you can cover it up so that no one can see it. And what this woman did was acknowledge the issue that she had at some level. We don't get the whole conversation. We don't know exactly what was said, but we know it's a lot more than an I'm sorry. Because repentance is more than just an I'm sorry. It's changing your life. It's turning away from the sin and going in a different direction. The living water equals life change. Acknowledging the Savior and removing the sin. We say it here, hear and believe. Repent, confess, be baptized, and live your life for Christ. That's how you become a Christian. You have to hear and believe who Jesus is. You got to know who's talking, who's offering this. Repent of your sins, turning away from them, putting them in the past, confessing that Jesus is Lord and being baptized into his name. If you need help with any of those steps, you can come down front. Elliot's right there already. You can come down right now and start talking to him. I'll be there in a little bit. You can find us on the way out. We have name tags on. That means that we're staff or elder. Um, and we would love to talk to you. You can email us at hello at swisscovechristian.com and you can text our phone number and say something along the lines of, I need to talk to someone. And we will get in touch with you. But as I read this story of the woman at the well from the perspective of a non-Christian, if that's you and you feel stuck, this story might resonate with you as needing to find a savior, as needing to go and ask for some living water. I would encourage you, don't hesitate to come and and find out what that relationship means, what it means to connect with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we want to help walk through you with this process because of one simple fact, and it's that healing is hard. Healing is really hard. Uh, It's really easy to hurt, to get hurt, and to hurt someone else takes no time at all. It's simple, (laughs) but healing from that hurt Healing from hurt is hard. Jesus not only wants to help you heal, but he wants to fully heal you from those hurts. And if you need help walking on that journey, we want to step with you every step of the way. As a Christian, this means reflecting over your heart, making sure you're good. And if you're not good, 
same things. We would love to talk to you and walk with you. But if you examine your heart and you say there isn't a persistent sin issue there, then this conversation with Jesus and the woman gives us another direction we could go. Jesus broke down man-made barriers to make room for salvation. This year we've been talking a lot about those people. You know, the people that we don't reach out to, that we don't talk to, that we don't talk about, that we don't even acknowledge exist. I don't know who your Samaria is or why they're your Samaria. But you need to ask yourself about those people. Is the barrier put there by man or is it put there by God? Because if it's put there by man for the sake of the gospel, it has to be broken down. And I say has to be. Social class, ethnic background, color of skin, political affiliation, all man-made boundaries that we set up in life. And I pick on politics a lot, but it's because if your Republicanness or your Democraticness is what is preventing you from reaching people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think it's about time that you throw that away. Break down the barrier so that the important information can be communicated, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus went into a place where he could have been arrested, he could have been killed. He didn't have to go through Samaria, but it said he had to. Don't let human problems stand in the way of God's solutions. That's what we do as a Christian, as a non-Christian. So what do we do as a church? Here's what this story tells us that we need to do as a church. Make room for repentance at the cove. Make sure that there is room for repentance at the cove because healing is hard. The cove should be a place where people can come and be vulnerable with the healing that they need and find it here. It is so hard to open up about an issue that you've been working so long to cover up. So when we come forward with that issue, we need to make sure as a church that we're a place that doesn't spread their story. It's their story, not ours. So don't tell it unless they want to be told. It's their story, so we're going to hold that tight and make sure it's a place where they're loved, prayed for, and can be walked together through with it. We're going to be a place that doesn't look down on people's stories. We don't pity someone's story because your sin is not greater or less than their sin. We might have gotten through our sin already as a Christian, but that doesn't mean that you're better than the person that hasn't yet. They still need to be helped through it. So we're going to be a place that doesn't spread their story. We're going to be a place that doesn't pity their story. And we need to be a place that loves people, prays with people, and walks through the valleys together with people. And that's why we say it all the time. We love you. We're praying for you. We're in this together. Father, we thank you so much for the story of the woman at the well and just the conversation that's had to be able to present living water to us, to sinners, that you were so willing to come down and, and give your life for us on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we even have the opportunity to repent. Father, help us to open up our hearts to you today, to make ourselves vulnerable to your spirit, and allow that very difficult healing process to start. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray.